Chapter Fourteen of Dr. Paul's Theory. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Dr. Paul's Theory by Alice Mangold Deal. Chapter Fourteen A Questionable Doctrine. Dr. Paul had but little sleep that night. He spent it reading a book which had been presented to him by its author a few months ago, and which he had then shelved at the top of his bookcases among works not likely to be required. The author was an old man, a Mr. Helvin, who had been a celebrated analytical chemist, but who had retired from active practice to pursue certain fantastic theories which had taken possession of his mind. He had been a frequent visitor at the Pinewood during Sir Roderick's lifetime. Hugh had seen him once since at a learned conversazione, and they had had some discussion, the result of which was that Mr. Helvin sent him a copy of his book, the result, he wrote in the accompanying note, of the research of a lifetime. Dr. Paul had thoughts which he chose to hide, not only from the whole world, but even, if possible, from himself. He took the book to his bedroom and only began to read when the last sounds of daily life had ceased within and without the house. The title of the work was On Certain Ancient Doctrines by a Modern Pythagorean. While cutting the pages, Hugh's attention was arrested by certain words on the fly-leaf. Book Two On the Age of Souls Where have I seen that before? he asked himself the words were familiar and recalled sensations the reverse of pleasant he pondered for a few minutes then he recollected memory carried his mind back to the night at the pinewood when after the day spent with lilia sir roderick had lent him a treatise written by a dutch author he had so he afterwards believed fallen asleep while reading it and had dreamt that he read a chapter or chapters of its second part which was entitled on the age of souls this finding in black and white that of which he had dreamt years ago was weird he turned over the pages that followed and the sense of the uncanny was intensified here almost word for word was the strange treatise which he had read in his vision long ago here was the history of the old doctrine of metempsychosis or the passage of the soul through many bodies in various lives there was also the speculation of the author or commentator that the object of all life upon the planet was to develop high spiritual force gradually slowly through its friction with material frames the speculator assumed this plan to be a merciful idea of a beneficent creator by which the soul when finally attaining to its eternal grandeur might not be overwhelmed with the magnitude of its obligations because it would recognize glory as principally earned by its long course of suffering and struggle meanwhile the author suggested that while the spiritual essence called the soul being eternal could have no age there being no such thing as time in eternity the duration of its inhabitants of matter was of different length in different cases courageous souls that fought bravely for perfection would attain it sooner than the less enterprising those who lent themselves to evil would retrograde would like sisyphus be perpetually at work at the same step in advance and those who failed to believe in the eternal might revolve in fleshly forms even while the globe itself continued in the universe in its present form he read and re-read certain ideas he had vaguely felt floating among his troubled thoughts of late were assuming definite shape throughout that hardest most perplexed reverie of his life he remembered certain facts lilia's unbelief during life her rebellion against the law of death at the last the strange knowledge the princess mercedes had had from her earliest years of the awful scene in his life mercedes who was born nine months after lilia's death ha <sighs> if i tell helven this he said to himself with a ghastly laugh at his own thoughts he will say that mercedes is lilia re-embodied 
did ever a romantic dreamer on subjects beyond our mortal powers of comprehension find such a case in point to bear out his wild imaginings lilia's death mercedes's birth lilia's wild love for him mercedes feeling that his presence was necessary to her well-being bah i am trying to justify my passion for that girl that is what i am doing he cried to himself in an excess of self-anger i want to justify my unfaithfulness to lilia whom if this is love i never loved god i would die a thousand times for this girl she has me soul body all no more would he deceive himself he knew now he knew that he was in the grasp of the one great passion of his whole life what should he do fly to-morrow if he chose he could cancel all engagements cast off all responsibilities leave all arrangements to his lawyer and start for anywhere without detriment to his one duty in life ralph his father was dead his sisters absorbed in their husbands and families he had no ties would it not be best to turn his back upon his great temptation he resisted the thought the fact was he shrank from the daily and hourly struggle against the longing for mercedes presence which he felt would arise when he had cut himself adrift i am exaggerating the situation he told himself summoning his ordinary common sense to his aid it throws one off one's mental balance to be confronted by such a coincidence as my dreaming of that fantastic stuff years before the man wrote it meanwhile he felt as if he would like to see helven again the feeling was so strong next morning that after he had finished his hospital work he drove to the publishers of the book his thoughts had so curiously anticipated to obtain its author's address the address was a street in bloomsbury with a new instinct to hide his doings dominating him dr paul would not drive there in his own carriage he telegraphed to helven asking him for an audience that evening the reply arrived during the afternoon with pleasure at eight helven so with an excuse for his absence to ralph at twenty minutes to eight hugh strolled out of the house and hailing a hansom in oxford street drove to blank street bloomsbury it was a large old neglected house smelling of damp and stale tobacco smoke a maid ushered dr paul up the blackened staircase into the large drawing-rooms once in their early days the reception-rooms of fashionable dames and doubtless gorgeous with tapestries and crystal chandeliers now dismal with dirt and dingy books papers and dusty odds and ends of crazy furniture there was one bright spot in the room a large lamp on the centre table where mr helven was bending over his papers a long pipe in his mouth ah he said in a pleased tone looking up from his work over his spectacles and laying aside his pipe i am glad to see you dr paul a chair for dr paul margaret if you please allow me i will help you and as courteously as if the dirtily dressed servant girl had been a refined lady the old man assisted her to remove some twenty or so large volumes from a chair and bowing her out of the room invited hugh to be seated this is unexpected he said beaming at his guest i remember meeting you about ten years ago you were then a confirmed materialist doctor scarcely that said hugh i have never altogether given up the simple tenets i learned in my mother's lap now that he was here burning to tell his story and to see the effect it would produce on the pythagorean a certain awkwardness made him preface his disclosures by ordinary talk for some minutes the two scientists spoke of the recent discoveries in physiology and other of nature's storehouses and of the careers or deaths of well-known scholars who had been present at the conversazioni where they had met then old helvin grew absent in manner and suddenly interrupted hugh in the middle of a sentence dr paul you have something to tell me he said what is it their eyes met 
they smiled i have a strange story to tell you said hugh but first you must understand that without my express permission it must go no further than your memory you will remember no fear of that then he told him of his last night's perusal of his work on certain ancient doctrines and of his strange dream of the part on the age of souls twenty years ago at the pine wood helvin was amazed i cannot doubt your impressions he said after hearing details but visionary though people think me i confess to but small belief in dreams i can believe that there may appear to be a strong similarity in a vivid dream to facts that afterwards ensue but you in your own book on the physiology of sleep refute the idea of impressions we receive in dreams and our waking memory of those impressions coinciding the fact is that when you thought you dreamt of those chapters i headed on the age of souls i had not even planned out their synopsis but you knew the doctrines then mr helvin said hugh the doctrines are as old as the hills dr paul said helvin but is your story a story of dreams i wish it were said hugh no what i have to tell you is simple fact i trust you so i will not disguise identities the tale is of my own life he briefly recounted his acquaintance with sir roderick his affection for lilia and their marriage not omitting his dream of a strange lady who spoke strange words to him with a foreign accent the dream which he believed now to have been a prevision of mercedes my wife loved me unreasonably he said at times i feared the feeling might become a monomania poor child when i had to tell her that she must resign herself to die there was a terrible scene he recounted the awful hour of his life when lilia exacted a promise that as soon as she was dead he would commit self-murder and how he was saved by the accident to the babe and mrs mervyn's consequent interruption with the child in her arms i was sitting at the table in the library when this friend with my child in her arms suddenly appeared he said pistols were on the table before me i was resting my arms on the table and my head was bent down upon them i am telling you these details because they bear upon the extraordinary part of my story well i was saved then followed nineteen years of hard work and solitude i have shunned society i went weakly to the pinewood to my wife's grave i did all i could to prevent my poor child from feeling her loss and in this sort of life i hoped to atone to my wife's spirit for breaking the terrible promise she forced from me on her deathbed i had many hours of wretchedness when i remembered her frame of mind when she passed into the infinite often and often i reproached myself that i had not taken her atheism more seriously that i had not made her realization of eternity my constant work since her death i have tried constantly in all possible ways to communicate with her soul wherever it may be but pray struggle do what i might i failed you with your knowledge believed it possible for an embodied spirit to communicate with the immaterial asked helvin leaning back in his chair surprised i did not believe but i shall i say hoped no scarcely that mr helvin when loss and grief and anxiety are brought close home to us to our very hearts where are we where are theories beliefs helvin looked at hugh whose pale cheeks were flushed with excitement as he might have looked at a newly found specimen of a rare genus i have never married he said dryly i do not understand these family feelings would you understand a being who rose from the dead to bear witness to your theories asked hugh when it happens i will tell you my opinion said helvin it has happened to me said dr paul at least when you hear what i have to tell you you will i think be glad that we have met years ago and now helvin assured him he was not credulous nor easily convinced hear me before you say more said hugh then he recounted his meeting with the princess the attraction she had felt for him the deep 
almost terribly strong affection that he had discovered to exist for her in his mind and the mystery of her visions of the crucial hour of his life what you say is peculiar and would certainly bear favourably upon the development of a case of transmigration helven admitted but there are other theories to be considered we do not at present understand the influence that embodied spirits have upon each other then he discoursed learnedly about natural affinities of the attraction between certain human beings of opposite sexes even at a first most cursory meeting when material law meets spiritual law it is difficult almost impossible to detect which of the two is at work he concluded by saying i can assure you doctor i could have filled volumes with cases of possible metempsychosis as plausible as well authenticated as yours had i believed that the record would further faith in that which i believed to be a fundamental truth the most staggering fact of all i have not yet told you said hugh somewhat repelled by the cool and calculating reception of his experiences by the philosopher my wife died on a certain date nine months less two days afterwards this girl who is conversant with my life story without ever having learned it who knows more of my true history than any one alive was born helvin looked curiously at him that is certainly strange he said more interested then he entered notes in a shorthand of his own invention in one of the manuscript volumes devoted to cases of this sort and hugh somewhat astonished took leave he could not understand helven's apathy placing himself in imagination in the old scientist's place he fancied that he would have been excited to enthusiasm at the statement of such a case as his if he could have seen and heard helven as he left him the old philosopher looked after him with a smile and a sigh fifty years old at least he muttered to himself and as much in love as they call it with a girl as if he were a boy then he took a few notes of the interview and resuming his work speedily forgot hugh and his throes as if no one existed but himself hugh dissatisfied a trifle disgusted too he hardly knew why strolled westward a fresh breeze met him as he walked up oxford street it made him think yearningly of the country of the heathery hills lying purple under a wind-blown sky of the pine-clad valley where the solemn trees stood as sentinels about a grave the busy thoroughfare was comparatively still only a few passengers were strolling west or east the street lamps twinkled redly in the clear summer night in contrast to the white glimmer of the stars in the fathomless dark blue above deep in thought hugh without noticing wended his way homewards through the square where lady forwood lived as he passed he saw her broom waiting in the half door open he was hurrying past to avoid a meeting he was in no humour for ordinary talk but lady forwood just as she was coming out had seen him and called out dr paul so eagerly there was no escape he reluctantly turned back I am going to a concert at Lady M. Blank's, she said, positively the last entertainment this season, and very few are in town to go, so my absence would be noticed. But you must come in. I have something most important to ask you. She caught the long train of her dress over her arm and preceded him to the dining room. There was something new in her manner to him which was half annoyed, half bantering. Now, sir, perhaps you will explain, she said, half laughingly the first intimation we had that we are to be your guests next month was a newspaper paragraph and you must acknowledge that that is hardly fair hugh stared at her hugh the newspaper paragraph i do not understand he stammered surely she began then with a glance at his face on which there was a comical expression of horror she turned aside and repressing a laugh fetched a newspaper from a side table and opening it showed him a paragraph in a column headed fashionable intelligence 
the prince and princess andriochi and sir david and lady forward will be the guests of dr paul at his residence the pinewood surrey next month hugh read it twice thrice before he believed that this experience was a reality then he turned to lady forward with a laugh a laugh of a strange exhilaration which was produced by the surprise the shock almost following upon his interview with helvin do you mean to say you have not received my letter he had said before he had even had the idea of speaking it seemed to him as if some other entity was speaking through his lips while his will remained passive and what the other entity uttered was a falsity not a line not a word said lady forward becoming serious whose fault can it be if the servants whatever fault there is in the matter is mine and mine only said hugh reckless with a feeling which was half delirious joy half despair but do you think when the princess's name has been taken in vain like this that they will come come lady forward looked blank surprise with her beautiful blue eyes you don't mean to say you have not asked her she cried i had hoped you would arrange it with her he said in desperation i thought i fancied the change in the quiet might be good for her so i was having the place done up i think myself i should have made sure of the birds before i got the cage ready said lady forward demurely although her inward comment was an amused it is really high time the poor man had a woman to look after him however you know you and i are old friends as friends go nowadays and i should so much enjoy invading you in your surrey hermitage that i will undertake to make it all right with the andriochis only tell me exactly when you want us you saw next month said hugh half savagely he would investigate the affair of the paragraph he would find out whose hand had precipitated his fate had cast the last straw to balance his destiny any day asked lady forward smiling any day he said somewhat brusquely just then sir david's voice was audible in the hall asking where my lady was here she called out it is all settled she said as her husband appeared an important letter miscarried thus the mistake then she entered into a voluble explanation which astonished hugh but appeared perfectly intelligible to sir david who shook his hand quite warmly as he stepped into the broom after his wife who had done this thing who was it who had fathomed not only his secret thoughts but had dared to publish them to the world i will know some day he promised himself then he went home and wrote to mrs mervyn the gist of the letter was that he and the house party might arrive any day after the first of september End of chapter 14chapter fifteen of dr paul's theory this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org dr paul's theory by alice mangold deal chapter fifteen extract from the diary of dr hugh paul the pinewood october eighteen blank they say lookers-on see more of the game than the players i shall write down all that has happened and review it as a third person might before sending a brief statement to helven i do not think myself that when he reads it he will retain any reasonable doubt of the reincarnation of lilia's soul i know now who instigated that paragraph but more of that in its proper place was i glad when my life was unexpectedly taken out of my own hands and my wild dream of entertaining mercedes and inviting the forwards at the same time was suddenly realized i cannot tell i have felt emotions called forth by an extraordinary position therefore cannot classify them my first step when i received a few words from mercedes that she and her husband would come here was to come down myself and see to things after sending off ralph a few days in advance 
a surprise awaited me i had certainly given mammy carte blanche to pledge my credit to any reasonable amount but hardly considered how thoroughly she would set to work i scarcely recognised the old broom under its new paint and varnish nor andrew the groom in his brand new livery as i drove through the wood the roads were in capital condition the young trees were flourishing the desolate look had gone the same with the garden the beds bright with flowers the turf close-shaven the house the house looked as when i first saw it the veranda and shutters bright green the creepers carefully trailed rover poor old nero's descendant after i don't know how many generations came leaping about me quite delighted at the change about him and there at the hall door stood mammy in a very becoming cap quite the mistress of the mansion ralph came springing out more like other lads than i have yet seen him poor boy i felt a pang of remorse has my barren life overshadowed his heaven forgive me if it has i thought i was doing my best the hall had been modernized the billiard table renovated but the drawing-room could it be the room where i saw lilia leaning against the piano the brown draperies the neutral tints had disappeared it was gold and white everywhere the room had positively a bridal look and even the plants in the white flower stands were white and yellow this looks a thorough woman's den i remarked if i were left to myself i should not set my foot across the threshold don't be churlish mammy said you have invited a princess and you must entertain her properly especially as it is only for once why only for once i asked poor innocent mammy how little she suspected who it was she was to play hostess to i thought they lived in spain she said looking curiously at me i hurried her upstairs where the arrangements for the guests were wonderfully managed then i felt a sudden uneasiness coming down in the train i had determined to give lilia god pardon me if i dare to call mercedes by her old name to give the one who is really my own darling the opportunity of showing herself to me in gleams of recognition of her old home i had planned that some day she should come into the library and find me seated at the table those pistols before me then then when i am convinced of her soul's identity my love for her and hers for me could not be sinful or even faulty it would be the most natural thing in the world now her old home was changed scarcely recognisable you have not done anything to the library i cried almost fiercely i fear for poor mammy seemed dreadfully upset as women call it until i pacified her the library furniture had been recovered and the position of the chairs and tables altered that was all i soon had all the things back in their places the books were untouched standing at the door the room looked so much the same i could almost conjure up the figure of sir roderick seated in his chair his long pipe in his mouth oh the misery of recalling the past yet yet had they not died would lilia's soul and my soul have ever known each other as they do now i went to meet her at the station they were all to have a saloon carriage the prince and princess the forwards and lady boisville i had invited the count much against my wish but in deference to lady forwards advice if you did not the prince might make an excuse at the last moment in which case it would hardly do for mercedes to come she said and recognising that she was right in her suggestion i wrote to the fellow fortunately he had accepted an invitation to deerstock and was going to the lakes on his way or said he was which amounted to the same thing driving to the station in the broom the wagonette followed for the men i felt a dread that she would not come it seemed too glorious a crown to my wasted weary life that she would live under my roof that every hour of each day i could look at her and listen to her voice that morning and night i should touch her hand impossible i said to myself 
it cannot happen it will not happen something will prevent it all at the last moment shall i ever forget waiting on the platform that september evening the houses and trees growing dark against a yellow sunset people coming out of the booking office and buying papers travellers by the incoming train porters trundling the luggage through the end of the platform how could they all go on in this senseless mechanical way when the one great event of my life was happening when joy was coming for the first time to my tired thirsty soul then came an awful minute the signal was down the electric bell had sounded ding dong ding dong went the porter's bell andrew i shouted it seemed to me a shrill frantic cry but it can scarcely have been for he only said all right sir and no one else looked round then i saw the steam cloud and the black engine front and rattle rattle the train came slowly nearer and alongside how slowly was tortoise ever so abominably languid in its creepings no one there that was my first belief i went up and down by the first-class carriages then someone touched me on the shoulder sir david they put us at the wrong end he said how jovial he looked in his shooting suit oh yes we've all come what more he said i don't know i turned and saw her wrapped up in a cloak her face so pale sweet and wistful under a heavy black hat just a little colour came to her lips as our eyes met and i took her hand upon my arm her touch strengthened me i cooled down and was able to behave decently respectably ralph appeared mrs mervyn had sent him i suppose and mr mervyn came out of the booking office i never was more delighted to see them in my life for lady forwood preferred the wagonette and i gave her and the prince and the other men over to mervyn and was thus able to drive home opposite her and lady boisville lady boisville good-natured soul was pleased with everything what white sand what purple heather what very majestic pines dr paul she said looking at the dear old trees through her eyeglass but my darling what did she say or think would she recognise would some gleam of a soul memory beyond our knowledge and power of understanding show itself i watched her narrowly breathlessly as the shadows flitted across her face i fancied i saw a troubled expression in her eyes it vanished as she looked at me she smiled can i walk here some day she asked me i replied that she must do exactly as she pleased i wished her to understand that while she was in my domain she was its queen she laughed a laugh which chilled me for it was lilia's laugh those two women so utterly unlike in outline feature colouring laughed alike one physical detail in common one only arrived home mammy welcomed her so warmly in so motherly a way i felt grateful the ladies disappeared to their rooms the cloud obscured the sunshine then came the prince and forward and the valets and maids and the rest of the inevitable paraphernalia well if you have the pearl i suppose you must take the oyster shell as well was this my old bachelor or rather widower domain which used to look so grim and forlorn all echoes and musty odours where ralph and i used to stroll about together in an aimless fashion always i fancy feeling a certain amount of relief when we got back to bustling london which however noisy and grimy is life full this pleasant well-lighted house where thanks to mammy's arrangements bright patches of colour met the eye at every turn deftly placed bits of china or banks of plants glowing with bloom i felt self-reproach no i have not lived as i ought to have lived i have taught my boy to live beside a tomb i went down to the drawing-room i was gazing at the fading sunset out of the open window after wondering at the pretty effects of light made by lamps set about the room with coloured shades when i started it was lilia's laugh again she came into the room 
she was dressed in glistening white with lilies at her breast and rover was leaping about her your dog is very friendly she said and she patted the obtrusive animal which was panting with pleasure he is not generally so i said with a scared sensation in the dim light it recalled lilia and her nero too forcibly he is mostly surly to strangers he reminds me of some dog but i cannot remember where i have seen the dog she said thoughtfully coming to me at the window but her attention was arrested by the sunset what happy minutes those were as we stood side by side gazing at the monarch of the sky sinking into his purple bed those were her words not mine it was delightful to see her look bright as she sat by my side at dinner in the evening she played her guitar and sang to it it was a peep into the country of her birth i could imagine the hidalgos and donas pacing amid the picturesque buildings and many other things when mercedes during this visit to me was purely spanish i almost ceased to believe in the identity i so firmly hold in my own mind as hers next morning i took my guests about the place carefully avoiding the terrace i had a plan about the terrace in the afternoon mercedes and i lady forward and the prince drove in the wagonette i took them to see the ruins of an ancient abbey lady forward absorbed the prince's attention for such a born bore as he is i must say he behaved very decently and i was able to tell my love the old tales of the bygone monastery and to watch the changing expressions that flit across her pure face like clouds across a summer sky what intense reverence this child woman has for all that is holy as we walked through the ruins of the monkish chapel i was shamed by her hushed almost awestruck manner god has lived here she said casting a longing look back as i removed the hurdle placed to keep out the sheep for her to pass out and it is a ruin god is everywhere i said yes she said but it makes me sad that those monks they are all gone from your land then she told me of all that the nuns had been to her in her haunted childhood of their cheerfulness their patience with the child who was unlike other children i did not wonder she reverenced religious orders for my part realizing as i did that lilia's love for me was the cause of mercedes sad life i blessed them returning home my chastened mood was roughly dispelled by a significant incident a fine barouche and pair drove past us in it sat colonel roderick pym his wife lady conwood how objectionable is that fashion of remarried widows retaining their late husband's name and his pretty stepdaughters i cut him dead as i have steadily done to my astonishment he bowed low raising his hat and the prince did the same i looked at mrs mervyn she got very red the prince explained who is that gentleman he asked me i see him with my friend the count i not know at all that he live here this explained the paragraph in the paper roderick pym and the count in league without absolute confirmation i would swear those two are our enemies our enemies how natural it has been to class myself with my twin soul but to what will it lead how will our spiritual union end that spiritual union which came about this wise first of all after some bright days spent almost entirely with her days made up of long strolls in the part of the garden which had been best kept up since lilia's death the flower gardens and the pine wood including the terrace i had let go it would have been useless expense to keep them trim and fair as in sir roderick's time after our drives our chats at dinner rendered livelier by little sparrings between lady forward and mrs mervyn and our talks in the softly lighted drawing-room peace was disturbed by a telegram which arrived one day at luncheon for the prince he turned a yellowish-white 
and a remarkably nasty expression changed his face from moderately pleasant to cowardly hanged on still he was well bred enough to conceal further emotion i saw mercedes look uneasy after luncheon he evidently asked her for a tete-a-tete -tete, quite an event between those two i was sitting in the library anxious when a tap came at the door and enter sir david and the prince the prince not feeling his english equal to the occasion paul wishes me to explain to you that some bad news about a recent speculation obliges him to return to town at once said sir david then evidently noticing my dismayed look he added hurriedly he asks a continuance of your hospitality for the princess of course i said i should be delighted i was not sorry to be rid of the man but somehow i augured ill for mercedes for the future heaven avert the evil whatever it may be no drive that afternoon the prince departed luggage valet and all i did not see mercedes till just before dinner she looked pale but not unhappy as i took her into dinner she said can i see you alone this evening during dinner the wild idea flashed across me to take her to the spot she had dreamed of the spot where i had seen her in that strange vision twenty years ago the very thought of it exhilarated me i was excited i felt as if each moment that passed a year was slipping from my shoulders i was rejuvenating i hurried the men over their wine then i went into the drawing-room and got mammy away into a corner don't look surprised at what i am going to say i said in an undertone and don't exclaim or look round you must do something for me she stared at me i must have looked wild but very quietly she said if i can it is the merest trifle i said i wish to show the princess a certain spot in the grounds by moonlight keep them all amused till we come back she said something but i did not listen i left her at once i made lady forward sit down at the piano and when every one was attentive she plays well i told mercedes to slip away quietly soon after i left the room and i went into the hall it was a glorious night with a brilliant golden moon that bathed everything in a warm light presently she came gliding into the hall and up to me like a ghost and would have seated herself on the divan but i said no the garden and wrapping her light cloak which was hanging near round her shoulders i took her out out into the stillness it was so still we could hear the voices of the people in the drawing-room and the sound of our footsteps on the gravel was so loud i fancied that it must be audible in the house we walked on for some time side by side in silence presently we came to the pine grove the light fell through the straight rows of slender trunks as the sunlight falls by day only it was a yellowish white that silvered the sandy water tracks glimmered upon the pebbles and made fairy dells of the clumps of bracken by common accord we halted here as we stood still a soft night wind arose and went sighing among the pine tops the feathered crests of the slim trees nodded to one another as if so it seemed to me they mourned my folly and she she drew a long breath this beautiful scent she said how i love it have you pine woods in spain i asked such as this no she said beginning to walk again there was not a shadow of embarrassment at being alone with me in almost a forest at this hour she was too simple-minded for that but this perfume it is like a room in our i mean my father's castle in the country in spain she explained that the duque's drawing-rooms as we call them were each furnished in some luxurious material one was all malachite from the doors to the table furniture another was silver another cedar in the cedar room i was most happy she said it seemed that i knew that odour it was like home 
and this scent of your pines is the same. Then I asked her what she wished to say to me. She hesitated for a few moments, then she put her hand on my arm with a childlike abandon so peculiarly hers. Tell me what I must do, she said. The prince, he has gone away to see someone else he should not go to see. She asked me such a question. Anger, jealousy. I have been angry, often, too often, but jealousy? I have condemned others for that meanest passion in human nature, and now I am punished. I know what it is. What do you mean? I said. I do not understand. Ha! Oh. It was a sob rather than a sigh. Monsieur, I am sure you do not understand, she said, once more standing still, but this time confronting me. You were good to your wife, I know that. I was not good to my wife, I said bitterly. You must not come to me for advice. Ask Lady Forward, Mrs. Mervyn, any one, not me. At that moment, I forgot my theory, that Mercedes' soul and Lilia's are one and the same. This was the wife of the Prince Andriochi, and I, daring to love her as no man should dare to love another man's wife, was burning with jealousy, and was false to Lilia's memory. Never tell me you are not good, she said. I know better. <laughs> The words were ordinary enough, but at the end of her speech she gave a little satisfied laugh, Lilia's laugh. I felt less human. The ghostly, creepy sensation reasserted itself. How can you know better? I said. I know you are good, she said. You are an angel among other men, and I ask you what I am to do. I should feel sorry, should I not, when the prince does wrong? I felt my breath go, as after a blow. Certainly, I said. Do not think me wicked, she said, her voice trembling. Oh, I knew I ought to be sorry when he was going away, and I knew well that he would see someone that he ought not to see while he is away, but I did not feel sorry. I am glad. Glad? I said, assuming as shocked a tone as I could. Sinner, liar, when I was transported with joy and relief. Surely not glad? Yes, glad, she said, because I should be glad if everyone would go and leave me alone with you. This is foolish, I said, chidingly. You will know better when you have seen more of me. Then I changed the conversation to the subject of her dreams. We were nearing the spot where I meant to test her identity. There was a narrow path between clumps of laurels. This was the path I had traversed alone in my dream years ago, when I emerged into the open I had seen this very woman, this woman I loved, seated on the stone seat opposite to me. Now, she was by my side. As we came across the grass plat, I summoned all my courage. I did not know whether I wished to be convinced that she was Lilia, or that she was not. I only felt abject fear. For the first time in my life I was an entire coward. I sickened. I was in a cold sweat. Will you sit here a minute? I asked. I want to see what time it is. I must strike a match under the bushes. There is too much wind here. I slipped away, and going round came slowly into the moonlight opposite to her. Ah, it was terrible to see her seated there, then to see her spring up and come to me, for once in my life to experience a realised dream. Let us go, she said, passionately. I had never seen her so disturbed. I remember, come. I accompanied her, passively. She went along the path between the laurels, then... After but a moment's hesitation, she took the path leading to the terrace. A few swift steps, and she turned back to see if I followed. 
come she said in a voice of pain come then after one more poise like a bird before it takes flight she hurried up the slope and was at the end of the terrace the wide grassy avenue was before us i joined her it was a long time since i had visited the spot the long grass was rank and weedy the beds were unkempt i could see that much in this light the scene by moonlight that light which chastens and beautifies was desolate what would it be by the light of day the shame that i had neglected this favourite resort of lilia's partially levelled emotions brought me back in some degree to ordinary common sense but my practical mood did not last long i followed mercedes across the grass blaming myself that i had let her come here to a spot which was a disgrace to its proprietor in its neglected state when to my astonishment she flung her arm about the stone fountain and turned upon me her face in the moonlight looked drawn i should scarcely have recognised her nor indeed should i have recognised her sweet dear voice oh what was it she said in those hard shrill tones i was so unnerved i can hardly recall those terrible words but she spoke with reproach where is the water here she asked there were fish goldfish silverfish where are they where are the flowers there were roses red roses there and pointing to a bed where sir roderick by careful expenditure had cultivated some hardy rose trees she fell prone at my feet i had my token she knew the place as it was of old before she had awakened in this world perhaps the greatest mystery among these many mysteries is this i can write it all down just as it happened calmly coolly as i should record an exceptional case in medicine i took her in my arms and carried her back through the wood into the flower garden of the house she was a dead weight but i was impervious to ordinary impressions then i laid her upon a wide wooden bench in the italian garden and by slow degrees she recovered before the clock struck ten she was able to join them all in the drawing-room i have a great power over her i found that when i had sufficiently rallied from my emotions to exercise my will that willing her to be her ordinary self while her hands were in mine and my eyes fixed upon her face brought her to as the nurses say at once this had opened up another aspect of affairs if i have this power over her may not that possibly be the cause of her liking for me even of her impressions of her dreams i must investigate search leave no stone unturned to unearth the truth too much is at stake next day i willed her to be cheerful and happy and she was so another symptom which i duly recorded i found she had not as perfectly clear a recollection of that terrible evening as i have myself i was thankful for this i was as commonplace as i could possibly be during those days before the prince's return i took care she should have no time to meditate and mammy lady forward and good lady boisville helped me i don't know what they have thought of it all but they have consciously or unconsciously abetted me with that woman's own gift of tact which is worth a king's no an emperor's ransom ay and far more the prince returned unexpectedly one rainy afternoon he came in a station fly when he entered the hall we men were playing billiards i fancied he looked sulky but during the short time that followed before the general departure he was amiability itself and has declared his intention of remaining in england the winter also to look out for a country house near here for the dr paul was seated in his library a misty autumn morning writing the above when a tap at his door disturbed him the servant brought him a telegram come at once to london this evening at half-past nine i will be at your house mercedes End of chapter fifteen
Chapter Sixteen of Doctor Paul's Theory. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Doctor Paul's Theory by Alice Mangold Deal. Chapter Sixteen. Mizpa. What was there in that telegram to cause Hugh Paul misgiving? ostensibly but little many things could have occurred simple in themselves to give mercedes an excuse to summon him that she would take advantage of an excuse to shorten their separation he well knew as he turned over and re-read the telegram he chided himself for the chill sense of impending trouble which was unnerving him but his efforts came to nothing he started for london at once in irrepressible perturbation of mind arrived home the commonplace aspect of the familiar old house somewhat relieved him of his mental oppression the housekeeper had had notice of his return in a week or ten days and charwomen were about there was a clatter of pails and the homely sound of busy brooms and scrubbing brushes he spent the hours till mercedes should arrive in superintending the arrangement of the library and pretending to dine his study lamp smoked just as he and the housekeeper had succeeded in coaxing it to burn with its wonted urbanity one quarter chimed from the nearest church clock tower a quarter past nine in a quarter of an hour she would be here and the big dingy room seemed to him full of the ill-savoured fumes of lamp oil he dismissed the housekeeper who knew he expected a patient and threw open the windows it was a clear night the stars shone brilliant specks in the dark blue he leaned out of the window listening for the roll of wheels for that peal of the hall bell which he longed for yet dreaded he would always long for her presence with an intense longing yet this longing would be tempered by the dread that he would betray himself in some unguarded moment would betray the passionate character of his love he mentally forecast the interview Leaning out in the sharpened autumnal air, he braced himself to endure, to keep himself at a completely respectful distance from the woman whose soul he believed to be the soul of his lost wife, and part of his own soul, but whose physical being belonged to the lazy voluptuary, the Prince Andriochi. It is hard, he told himself. Oh, God, thou alone knowest how hard. The wild apostrophe brought a calm, a sudden peace, as if his guardian angel had laid its holy hand upon his heated head, and as he took courage from the sense of occult help in his sore need, the clock slowly, warningly, it seemed to him with some knowledge of what was to come, chimed the half hour. Would she come? What was it all about? Perhaps the next few minutes' silence and suspense were the worst of his life. Often afterwards, looking back into his past with a shudder, he thought so. Yet the ring of the bell, sudden, impetuous, when it did come, was horrible. The sound of her voice, the slow footsteps along the hall, he clenched his hands as he listened, and cold drops of sweat were on his brow. He went slowly to the door and opened it, for his limbs were stiff and heavy, disobedient to his will had he expected to see her also unnerved trembling he did not know but the calm with which she entered was a shock to him please shut lock the door she said quietly but with a desperate calm imperiously but in a tone of voice in which command was mingled with respect i have come she said throwing aside her cloak and seating herself by the table to tell you my friend what will cause you grief what will make you angry but i must tell you for your sake and for mine he stood facing her wondering at the extraordinary change in her in her whole outward self her lovely face was pale and delicately beautiful as ever but there was a new sternness about her sweet mouth a look of absolute will in her dark lustrous eyes which completely altered her the clinging tender girl had given place to the determined woman 
what is it he asked what has happened i will tell you she began evidently nerving herself for some disclosure just as it happened you know that the prince a look of pain contracted her features and she blushed slightly as she said the word my husband liked the pine wood you know she stopped and looked pleadingly up into his face he liked you liked our friendship some warning of what was to come arose in his mind ah at last some good-natured friend some meddler had stepped in between him and his long waited for happiness in life go on he said in a hard tone turning away from her the prince knows you and he knows me she went on proudly well i must tell you what happened last night we the prince the count and myself we went to the new play the prince did not like it and went away to his club i was sitting not talking the count was silent also when i heard the voices of men it was between the acts in the next box they spoke of you and of me what they said was an infamy ah do not look so monsieur you and i we have a champion the count he did hear it also and his anger against these men was great he at once took me away down the staircase procured my carriage and i came back to my house he told me he would avenge my honour your honour at eleven o'clock he came in he told me he had challenged the man who said that infamy that to-day they would fight not here in england but in france and he said good-bye this she drew a case from her bosom this is the name of the man who separates us monsieur for i also have come to say good-bye to-morrow i go home with the prince to spain it was so abrupt her calm yet confused statements were so unexpected that for a moment hugh's head swam he had to steady himself by placing his hand on the back of a chair then he took a slip of paper that she held out to him and holding it near the lamp saw in her handwriting colonel roderick pym as he gazed upon that familiar distasteful name he seemed to have known all along that this must come this moment this interview that this was what had cast a shadow on their relations that this was the end once he said half to himself half to her it seemed to him as if her mind ought to recognise his thoughts without the outward expression of words once i robbed this man of someone he loved and now he robs me of you as he sighed out that last word he recollected perhaps at that moment roderick pym was dead his revenge had cost him his life for the count would be a dangerous antagonist he was a skilled swordsman and a dead shot how when do they fight he asked breathlessly with the instinct to stay that duel at any cost fight she spoke almost indignantly do you think i would let the good count kill himself for me even for you tears stood in her eyes i knelt and prayed him she said i begged him but he would not hear me he said would you have me be a coward then at last he said to me if you will promise me that to-morrow you will go home to spain with the prince and will never see or speak to him again i too will go with you and will sacrifice me or no she paused and hung her head so as i have promised i have come to say good-bye she faltered yes he had known this all along he felt he had this was the end the end of a promised passionate joy the end of delights of eye and ear of heart soul mind body all yes he said meekly bowing his head i understand we part it is all over for ever oh no she cried with sudden life and her face was alight with love and hope only for here you know who should know better than you how short is this life you who always see the dead and dying is that death that which we call death she asked him passionately 
do you think it do you not rather think that this is dying this living in a place where you must not love where people hate and torture each other and happiness cannot be for no one will let another one be happy he went to her and took her slender cold hands in his for the last time it does not matter he said bitterly yet feeling with a strange joy that this sacrifice of love ennobled their love raised it from a common thing to divinity no one can separate us after death if god wills us to be soul to soul one for ever a strange expression flitted across her face for one instant it seemed to him that this was not mercedes but lilia then came the memory of that awful deathbed when lilia defied the will of her creator and would have forced him her husband to die with her and he contrasted that hour of rebellion with this hour of humble renunciation this is her soul he thought in mingled awe and gratitude roderick would have caused our misery instead he has saved us from an evil life together for here in this painful world to be united in eternity this was his actual death he felt as he silently gazed into her eyes this parting physical death after this would be nothing would indeed be welcome for a moment he thought to take her just this once into his arms to let her heart beat against his breast to feel her lips upon his mouth but before the thought was really born in his mind he killed it and flung it from him risk eternity for a moment he said to himself no he dropped her hands and smiled at her the smile she might have seen with the eyes of her soul upon the face of her angel guardian there is no more for us to say now he said but to pray for each other by and by we shall have time to see what this means this you and i being but one soul she rose and kept her eyes steadily fixed upon him then she slowly walked to the door how slowly she passed from the room he never knew their eyes dwelt upon each other and till she was gone he felt that never even in infinite glory could they be more really wedded than now the door was half open the room was empty save for himself and the shadows the whole door was gently shut he heard the sound of carriage wheels all was over he sat down stupefied this dead future which loomed blankly before him was stupefying a dense blackness a hopeless nothingness the hours passed the lamp flickered and went out still he sat there gazing at vacancy his mind groping about in this dreary cloud of fathomless misery he thought nothing tangible felt neither cold nor fatigue at last he began to wonder vaguely whether this was all that really existed this dull senseless apathy as he began to wonder his attention was attracted by a brilliant speck of light at his feet tiny at first it seemed to grow larger and brighter as he looked a mere pin's point of light at first in a few minutes it was a disc of some size then he saw an object he knew well a steel urn at the end of his library fender with a flush of pain he was alive again alive conscious of anguish of separation from her his darling his adored he seemed to see her retreating from him steadily hopelessly with a cry he sprang up that light was a mocking sunbeam he saw it now creeping in between the shutters he went to the window he flung open the shutters and defied the day or would have defied it but he was face to face with the glory of the sunrise the whole sky was golden and crimson clouds floated upward stately attendants upon the magnificence of the young day soft white rounded masses were like smiles upon the clear blue sky all meant life and hope and love and as he gazed he felt abashed at his own littleness what was he but a speck upon the bosom of the earth that little steel urn was greater in the shine of the world's sun than was he in the light that streams from the eternal 
I must reach it, he told himself. I must be more than a speck of dust. What is suffering, what is dull commonplace, but the ladder by which we climb to immortality? That was his crucial hour, the bridge over which he passed from unrest to peace. None who knew him ever guessed the secret motives of his afterlife. They thought him more energetic, larger-minded, gentler, and more sympathetic. But he was envied as a man who seemed to have fathomed the mystery of peace on earth. He died suddenly. A month before his death, he received a letter from a Spanish priest, who informed him of the death of the Princess Andriochi, and enclosed him a sealed envelope addressed to him in Mephedi's handwriting. He recognized the writing at once, though in character it was larger and firmer. It contained a slip of paper on which was inscribed one word, Come! That word seemed to pierce his heart like an arrow. From that day his strength waned, his health failed. His household were hardly astonished when, one morning, he was found sitting in his chair by the library window, the early sunlight hovering about his dead, smiling face. He passed away, smiling, a joyful smile that none had ever seen upon his face before. End of chapter 16 End of Dr. Paul's Theory by Alice Mangoldia Thank you for listening.